All right, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Hey, this is the day that the Lord have made, and I will rejoice and be glad. Any good morning to you, and thank you so much for tuning in to In the Backyard with Pastor Perry. But hey, as you can see, I'm in another part of my backyard. I'm actually sitting in the uh, section that my wife, this is my wife's section right here. She normally comes out here, sits in this area. This is where she reads at and does what she does. But I'm sitting in her section tonight. I mean, today, so don't y'all tell her, all right? Don't tell her that I'm sitting in her section. You know, she got it all pretty out here with little tables and everything and stuff, flowers and stuff all set around in this section. So don't y'all tell them I'm sitting in her section today, all right? <laughs> hey, good morning to everybody. Good morning to our Instagram audience. Good morning to our Facebook Live audience. Today, y'all do me a favor. Share, like, tag, invite. Start a watch party this morning. Get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman, all right? Shout out to my wife, Pastor Sophia, who's on. My auntie, Dorothy Perryman, is on today. Miss Shirley Powell is on today. Look like it's getting ready to start raining here in a moment. Hey, shout out to Frederick Milner. My dude is on today. Good to see you, man. Hey, Miss Kelly Johnson, Miss Cassandra James Moore is on today. Miss Teresa Wells is with us today. Hey, Bam is on today. Shout out to you. Miss Jennifer Smith, got to give you my pound, girl. So good to see you today. Miss Juanita Carter is rocking with us. Miss Gloria Turner is in the house. If I was in front of you, Miss Gloria Turner, I would give you a high five, turn around, and then give you a hug, too. <laughs> so shout out to you guys. Thank y'all so much for being on today. But do me a favor. Share, like, tag, invite. Start a watch party, get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Pam. Yep, I believe it's going to rain, so we're going to have to get this word here and get ready to, uh, to get it. We need this rain out here, boy. It's hot as all get out. But listen, share, like, tag, invite. Start a watch party, get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Pam. All right, shout out to Miss Abigail Yates is on today. Uh, good to see you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. So share, like, tag, invite. Start a watch party. Get your coffee, your water, your juice, your tea. Whatever you're drinking. Hey, my wife made some amazing coffee, so I got to get mine this morning, all right? Coffee is saved, though. Shout out to Tony Johnson. Miss Bambi is on today. Miss Kelly Johnson is with us today. Good to see you. But let's get into it because it's going to start raining pretty soon, so let me get into it. You know, a number of years ago, I gave my life to Christ in 1999. Many of you know my story, how I radically got saved and life transformed and changed. Came into the church. And I thought that I would see some things that were completely different in the church. Then I came to the realization that what some of what I saw in the streets was better than what I saw in the church. I never thought that I would see people who would put people down and people who would belittle people because after all, we inside the church, this is different. And one day, I'll never forget them in the church. And at this time I was married to somebody else other than Pastor Sophia. And during this time, the women of the church could go to the pastor of the church and talk about their business. You know, I, well, I'm having issues in the home, and they would go, and they could talk about it. And next thing you know, what was being spoken of would be preached across the pulpit. And I'll never forget the one day I'm in, bio, I'm in Sunday school, and I'm hearing me being preached on in Sunday school. And this, this, the pastor at this time said to my mother while she was teaching Sunday school, you know that son of yours is no good. That son of yours is no good, and he ain't gonna never amount to anything. And I watched my mama have tears rolling down her eyes, and she couldn't say anything. And I'm sitting there, instantly I get angry. But I can't jump up and say what I wanna say, because I'm angry too. Because I know me, if I, if, I, if I flip out, I'm gonna flip out for real, for real. Y'all see me on Channel 7 News. So, so I, I, I can't flip out, but I'm watching my mother, she got tears streaming down her eyes. I'll never forget my mom looked, to, looked at me and she said to me, she said, Chris, God don't see us. God don't see you like we do. And she, what she was saying was that God don't see you the way other people do. I never forgot that. From time to time, my mother will talk to me from time to time and she will say to me, Chris, God don't see people the way we see people. In a sense, my mother is saying, that we have to give people the benefit of the doubt. Not only that, but we have to understand that God loves people, and if God loves people, we gotta love them too. That if God cares for people, we have to care for them too. And there are many times what we do is we judge people based on their past. We judge people based on our perception of them. And for many people, their perception of you is their reality, even though the reality may not be true. They got a perception of you. They heard somebody talk about you. They heard something about you. They don't really know if that's true. It's what they heard. Maybe they have seen you and knew of your background. 
Maybe they participated in your background. And so what they do is they still judge you. And I gotta be honest, when I came out, when I was in them streets, I was in them streets for real. You talking about a dude who was playing basketball, a dude who was chasing the women, a dude who had multiple women, a dude who was out there in the streets selling drugs. You understand? I didn't just have one woman, you understand? And maybe two or three of them in the city. I, I, had, I had one in one in Arizona, one in Houston, Texas. You understand? I had, 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 had one over here, one in Compton, one in, one in Long Beach. You understand? I, I had women. I had multiple women everywhere. You understand? I, w I wasn't stationary. I wasn't the man that I am today. I was out of control. I was doing me. You understand? And then I didn't. And then when I gave my life to Christ, because I got to my wits end and I started to realize that this ain't the life that God wants me to live. This ain't the life that I should live. This ain't the light that my kids ought to see a father living. So here I am. I throw myself on the mercy seat of God and God, I, I want to be saved. And I would have thought that people would have embraced me. But they didn't. They criticized I learned later on from my mother. This is why it's always good if you got a mother to talk to them. I learned later on from my mother that sometimes people can hate you and dislike you and they don't even know the reason why. And literally it's because there's something on the inside of you that they know is there, but they can't put their finger on it. So they hate you because they thinking that it should be me and not him. It should be me and not her. It should be me and not them. So in a sense, it's really fear. And here's what God has a way of doing. God has a way of bringing those people back to you that needs help. He has a way of doing this. The Bible tells us the story. The scripture says that here Moses now has married an Ethiopian woman. The Bible says that Aaron, Mary's, Moses' brother, and his sister Miriam gets together and they begin to talk about Moses and they say to Moses, they say to say to each other, God speaks to me too, just like he does Moses. I, I'm, a, I'm a priest too. I, I prophesy too. God, he ain't the only one that God speaks to. And the Bible says that they're upset with him because he marries an Ethiopian woman. When you study it out now, when you study it out, this is why you just can't read scripture at face value, especially in the book of Numbers. You can't read things at face value. You got to read it, but you got to go into deeper understanding of this. So you watch this now. So now all of a sudden the Bible says the anger of God is up. God's anger is, is kindled now. God comes down and he says, to, he says to Moses, he says, you three come out to the tabernacle. And the Bible says these three come out to the tabernacle. When I read that point, I read that part, I said, now, wait a minute, God, why would you call Moses to the tabernacle? He did no wrong. They were talking about him. They were criticizing him. So why would you call Moses out? And the Bible says that here God starts to speak to the three of them. He says to Moses, he says to Miriam and, and, and Aaron, he says, were you not afraid to speak out against my serpent Moses? And here's what God says. I don't see him the way you see him. And here's what God says. He says, uh, with you, I talk to you in dark speeches and foreign type languages through dreams and things of that nature. He says, but not so with my servant Moses. I speak to him mouth to mouth. One translation says he speaks to him face to face. In a sense, he's saying, God, that Moses has a relationship with me that I don't have with you. So he says, were you not afraid to speak out against my servant Moses? And all of a sudden now, Aaron realizes what's about to take place. He knows that he's about to be judged by God. And he looks over and he sees his sister Miriam and now she is smoked with leprosy. And the first thing that, that Aaron does, he falls on his face and he starts to turn and cry out to Moses. He says to Moses, oh my God, my father, please forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for what I did. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't turn to God and ask God to forgive him, but he turns to Moses and asks Moses to forgive him. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at Miriam. I can see her in the, in the spirit realm. She, she's full of leprosy. And you know, during that time, if she was full of leprosy, she would have been thrown out. And watch this now. God now is about this passing judgment on her. And so Moses now stands up and he begins to plead the case for both of them. And he says, oh my God, please spare her life. Please don't kill them. Don't kill them. Spare, your, spare their life. And here's what God says. God says, if her father but has spit in her face, should she not be embarrassed? Should she not be put to shame? And so here's what he does. He smokes her with leprosy. That is a form of God saying he spit in her face for the way that she mistreated and the way that she talked about his leader. So now all of a sudden she's put out of the camp. And the Bible says for seven days, the people, the church, the church couldn't move for seven days. All of Israel couldn't move for seven days because they too spoke out against the leader. And I'm sitting here wondering now, why would Moses stand? and plead the case of a people who have ridiculed him and ostracized him and talked about him. And he didn't do it once or twice, but you did it on a continuous basis. Who, 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 would, 
Who would do that? And I found out the reason that Moses is standing in the place He's standing with the three of them. It is because God needed a legal loophole to forgive them for their sins. And he needed Moses to be the one that would stand and plead the case for his people. See, watch this now. You're going to find out in this season of your life that the people who once ridiculed you, the people who once criticized you, the people who once ostracized you, the people who once put you down, the people who once talked about you are going to be the one who are going to have to come back to you for help and support. And you're going to have to take a look at Moses and you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to be able to forgive the people who've done you wrong. Because here's what God has done. He's raised you up in the midst of adversity and chaos to be his representation. And you got to see this. This is your opportunity to go to the next level. This is your opportunity to say that I'm not holding animosity. I'm not holding grudges. I don't have this against you and I don't have that against you. But I'm going to take this leap of faith because I know I'm going to the next level. You are just a test for me to pass to get to my next level. You are just a test the path for me to pass to get my prayers answered and there are many people today who are watching me and people have criticized you because of your past they've seen the things that you've done they've seen the mistakes that you have made for some of you you may have been in the homosexual lifestyle and here you are you've made a change and you've given your life to Christ and here you are you love God a thousand percent but you're battling this dark spirit this dark spirit comes for you you're praying and you're giving God glory. You, 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 you're doing all you can. You're worshiping God. You're praying. But this dark spirit keeps coming. And here's what happens. The people remember your lifestyle. Now here's what they won't do. They won't let it go. They won't let it go because that's all they can understand and comprehend about you. They won't let it go because that, that's their way of keeping you in bondage. And so they talk to you. Hmm. I remember when you was like this. I remember when you was doing that. You, have you seen him lately? Have you talked to her lately? You understand? Bringing up your past to bring you back into bondage. And here's what you have to do. You have to be the person that said, this ain't who I am. This is not who I am. Is it a fight for you to break out of this lifestyle? It is a fight for you to break out of this lifestyle. See, a lot of times in the Christian world, we don't like to address certain sins. If the person is, has dealt in a homosexual lifestyle, they should go to hell. If the person has didn't done this and done that, they should go to hell. But, but you know, I, I was just a man who was just sleeping with women. I shouldn't go to hell. You should give me a pack. That's all I did. May I tell you today, may I tell you today that sin is sin in the eyesight of God? It's in the eyesight of God. So don't be running around here trying to make one sin better than the other. The Bible said all have sin and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us have done something that we should not have done. Every one of us has said something that we should not have said. Every one of us have been some places that we should not have been. Every one of us has told lies. Every one of us has done some things that we should not have done. But here's where we are. We're too busy judging people. And we don't understand that God loves that person. Somebody was preaching one time and they, they were talking about Charles Manson being on death row. And they talked about how God loved Charles Manson. I never forget, I said, man, come on, come on, man. This dude done done a lot of heinous stuff. He loved Charles Manson too. Huh? Come on, man, no, come on. And I'm trying to justify this. Man, he, he done this, he done this, he done that. And then when they was talking about Charles Manson, I could see a person like Adolf Hitler in my head. He loved him too. Come on, man. This dude will kill millions of people, millions of Jewish people. He loved him too. And the scripture comes into my head. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It, it didn't say, for God so loved the one who does right. For God so loved the one who's educated. For God so loved the one who's got degrees. For God so loved the one who lives in the right neighborhood. For God so loved the one who's connected. It didn't say that. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. May I tell you today that God does not see people the way we do? Maybe God doesn't see folks the way you do. He knows what he has deposited on the inside of people. He knows what he has placed there. He knows what the person is supposed to be. You may look at an individual early on in their life and see them as being bad because of the things that they have done. He's mischievous. She, she does too much. He, he, he's out here running the streets and doing some stuff. He ain't got no business. She thotting. He, he out here robbing folks. He out here killing people. They are they robbing together. All of this type of stuff. That's what they were doing. But God is looking past all of that and he sees what he has called them to be. Mm. How you know this, Pastor? The Bible says that here Paul now has letters from, from, the, from the Sanhedrin, letters from the chief priests to go into different cities and towns and and even go to other countries to kill Christians. If he didn't kill them, he had the legal right to arrest them and throw them in jail because 
they, they wasn't worshiping God the way we do. They starting a new religion. They got people following this man named Jesus. Here he is. The Bible said he held the coat of the people who stoned Stephen. So what? What? So in a sense, he was an accessory to murder. Not not only did you commit murder, not only did you falsely accuse people and put them in jail, but you're an accessory to murder too. And all of a sudden, here God looking at him and sees him on the Damascus Road on this way to kill Christians and to put him in the jail. And the Bible said, the sun shine brighter than the noonday sun. There's a light that shine brighter than the noonday sun and it shines on him. And here's what God says to him. Jesus says to him, why are you kicking against the pricks? You got to study this thing out. What, what does it mean? Why is he kicking against the pricks? He's saying, why are you using your feet? To constantly kick against thorns. He's, he's talking about a wall that has that has thorns protruding out of it, sticks protruding out of it for protection. And here's what you're doing. You keep kicking against it. Why are you keep kicking against the prick? Why are you doing this? You are not in, you are not hurting them. You are literally hurting yourself. And here he is, face down now. And he says, Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you persecuted. Hmm. Wait a minute now. I'm persecuting you, and I ain't never seen you before. I'm persecuting you, and the people said you died. Watch now. I persecute you when I mistreat his people. I persecute you when I talk about his people. I persecute him when I criticize his people. Watch now. I persecute people. I persecute him when I belittle his people. And there are people today, you don't even understand that God does not see people the way you see them. The Bible tells us he's long suffering. I, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he's long suffering. I'm glad because there's some things that I have done that that could have got on somebody's last nerve and did get on somebody's last nerve. There's some things that I got that I've done that, that caused people to want to fight me. There's some things that, that I have done that caused people to draw guns down on me. I'm talking to somebody today. Uh, I'm talking about this person got his gun drawn down on me and I got mine drawn down on him. The first one to pull the trigger is the one that's going to live. You understand? I've been in a life and death situation. And, and so here I am. I'm grateful that God is long suffering because if he was not long suffering, I would not be here today. If he was not long suffering, I would not be here preaching the gospel today if he was not long suffering i would not be the man that i am today god doesn't see people the way you do and you ought to be glad about it people can change they, they can change i i never forget i was talking to, to my to my daughter one day and i was telling her that people can change because she was dealing with some issues with one of her friends this is a few years ago and i was telling her, i said hey listen your friend going through some stuff at home that you don't know about like, no, nah, Dad, I can't mess with her no more because she done said some stuff about me. And, and you know, and, and we, it was, we was about to have it out at school. And so I just had to say, I, I, ain't, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't bothering with you no more. I ain't talking to you no more. I forgive you, but I can't have you in my space anymore. And I said, okay, I get you. I get you. That, that's your prerogative. But I'm telling you, this young girl is going through some things at home. And says, okay, Dad, she can go through whatever she want to go through. I still don't want her in my space anymore. And I done told her, I ain't talking to you no more. Don't call me, lose my number. We ain't friends no more or nothing like that. I said, well, girl, you got too much of your daddy inside of you. And so, so, so here I am talking to her. I said, sweetheart, the very same person that you see today may not be the person that you see tomorrow because people can change. Don't let one issue define that person's life for you. Don't, don't let one person's issue define that person's life for you. Don't, don't, don't let it happen. Don't let that happen because that very same person one day could wake up and become president of the United States. That one person could, could, that one person could change and change a nation. Don't, 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 don't define that person by an issue about things that have gone on in their life. And she says, okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll think about it. But here's the thing. I wonder how many people have you prejudged because of things that have happened in their lives. I wonder how many of you have criticized somebody because of the things that you have seen them do. And now here you are. You've judged them based on their actions from back then. And you don't even understand that they're a changed person now. The Bible says it to us like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you meet Christ, you become a new creature. If I'd have held fast to the sermon that was being taught in Sunday school that morning, and talking about, you know that son of yours ain't no good. If I'd have held fast to that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I watched them prefer other people up in the church preaching 
and wouldn't give me an opportunity. If they did give me an opportunity, they would give me one or two minutes to stand and speak. I had to do what I needed to do in two minutes, three minutes tops and go sit down. Nobody wants to hear me. Nobody wants to do this because everybody was looking at me and looking at my past. Was my past what they heard about me? Was it true? Yes, yeah, some of it was true. 90% of it was true. The things that I did wrong in them streets, was, was some of that true? Yes, 90% of that was true. Was I a womanizer doing that time? Of course I was. Was I a man out who was a whoremonger? Yes, I was. Was I a man who was out there ready to fight and draw down on people and all this stuff? Of course I did. But when I gave my life to Christ, they did not see that I had radically changed. All they could see was what somebody told them about me. Ne never, never really saw me in person. So here I am. I come into the church. I'm not like the other dudes. I'm not broke when I walk into the church. You understand? I, I still had some street money when I came into the church. You understand? So you had some street money. I come into the church. I'm not broke. I, I, I'm not sitting up in here trying to figure out how I'm going to pay my light bills and gas bills. Reverend got a knock. You understand? I got some money put to the side. I, I, I don't make no sense for you to hustle all your life and you ain't doing nothing but being able to pay your light bills and gas bills. You ain't got no money. That don't make no sense. So here I am. I got a few dollars. So you understand? I got some suits. You understand? I got plenty of suits. You understand? I got nice shoes. I got nice ties. I got nice stuff. You understand? You got to remember, my best, my best friend during that time was Nate Dog. When everybody was wearing the three-piece suits with the Godfather hat, Reverend had all of that. So when I came into church, I was not half-stepping. I wasn't like I, I'm just come off the off the streets and I'm wore out and tore up from the floor. No, I was looking sharp. I was looking good. I had my game tight. And so everybody was judging me based on my past. Maybe God don't see people the way you see them. Maybe God don't see them the way you do. Maybe Jesus' death on the cross is to bring people in so they could get cleaned up and then go out to do what he's called them to do. Who would have ever thought that Jesus would have called Peter? Peter was skilled with the knife. He had no problems with cutting your ear off. So watch this now. Jesus had gangsters on his team. I'm talking to somebody because there are many of you, you got issues of attitudes with people who come out the hood and who come out the streets. These people are loyal when they come because they were loyal in the streets. These people know when, when they, these people know how to discern certain things and know when folks are trying to get over on them. They in the streets. Listen, in my church, I got a few of them. I got a few of them that can throw them. That's why you, that's why I love the women in our church because I got some that come out of these streets that know how to do this for real, for real. Not any of this, but they know how to do this for real, for real. And I always say to them, don't get rid of that attitude. Don't get rid of that mentality because God gave you this mentality. You are in the kingdom for a reason. And so here we are. We're discrediting people because of where they come from. You can't discredit people from because of where they come from. You can't discredit people. Peter is a gangster. He's cut folks ears off. He's skilled with the knife. And yet Jesus had him on his team. I'll take you back to the Old Testament. The Bible says, here David now. He's been anointed king, but he's not in the position of king. And the Bible says he got 600 trained soldiers on his team. They're his bodyguards, his personal bodyguards, and every one of them was a killer. So here's what he had. He had killers around him. And guess what he didn't do? He didn't get rid of them. He didn't throw them away because they was useful in his kingdom. Stop ostracizing people and criticizing people. They are useful in God's kingdom. The very woman who's loud and who won't, who won't take no mess and who will stand up to people, it's the one that God needs in the kingdom. We can't kill the gift. We have to learn how to control their gift. We, we, can't, we can't kill their gift. We got to teach them how to control it. Your anger is needed, baby, but we got to teach you how to control it. Because don't nobody want to go to go to war with just people who play the tambourine, with just people who just praise and worship, saying that that's all you do is just saying, no, we need somebody who know how to fight. We need somebody who know how to shoot somebody. We need When you're in the spiritual battle, you need somebody who knows how to fight and somebody who knows how to get down. Why? But we have everybody in church with all long dresses on and they just shout, Satan, I rebuke you. No, you need somebody that can go to war for real, for real. And so here we are, we're criticizing, ostracizing, and we don't even understand. The very person that we're criticizing could be the one that God will use to bless your life. I'm talking to somebody today because you got to get rid of these religious rose-colored glasses and see that the kingdom of God is made up of all kinds of people. The Bible talks about cast the kingdom of God is, is, is as if a man would cast a net. And when he, when he casts a net, he drags in all kinds of fish. I know Miss Irene is on here, she fish. Listen to this. They ain't always catfish in the net. 
Jesus cast a net, it wasn't just catfish, it wasn't just red snapper, it wasn't just perch, it wasn't just gar, it wasn't just buffalo, you understand? There, there was some other stuff that was caught up in there. Some other fish, and everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason. I'm talking to somebody today because we criticize and ostracize, but we have forgotten that there is a righteous indignation that God has placed on the inside of us. The mother that sees her child getting ready to get beat up or get shot and killed or, or even getting ready to be destroyed by the police or killed by the police. She ain't running out there with the tambourine. I'm on the praise team. Been running with the tambourine. This is the day that the Lord has made. No, she going to run out there and get in between that police officer and her child. And she going to cover her child up. And even if he's pointing a gun at her child, she will charge him and fight him to save her child's life. Why is that? That's a righteous indignation on the inside of her that says, I'm not going to let you kill my child. What if she was the one who was just out there with the tambourine? See, there's something on the inside of us that God has placed there. And we have to stop criticizing everybody. Maybe God don't see people the way that you do. See, if you were to take the opportunity and have empathy for an individual. See, to have em empathy for an individual means I put myself in their shoes. And after I put myself in their shoes, I understand how they feel. And now I know I don't want that for myself. And if I don't want that for myself, I should not want it for that individual. And there are a lot of people who are in the Christian world who don't have empathy for people. See, you can't be a real Christian if you can't have empathy for another individual. You can't be a real Christian if you can't forgive folk. You can't be a real Christian if you don't love people. See, I can love you. I can forgive you. But it don't mean I got to hang out with you. You already proven to me that you have robbed me. You already proven to me that you'll steal from me. I don't have to hang out with you. But if I'm going to make it into this kingdom, I got to forgive people. I have to forgive people. And I'm talking to people today who you have prejudged folk. Some of you that you may have had, you may have children in your, who, who, are, who are battling their identity. And you've been hard on the child because of where they are. I didn't raise you like that. Where did you get this from? Why are you acting like this? I didn't raise you like this. And so you're extra hard on the child. When the child comes around, you got this look in your face about the child. Have you ever stopped to think? That God knew what would take place with the child, and yet he trusted you to raise the child? He trusted you to raise the child. He trusted you to raise the child. The child was not born to you by accident. God gave you this child. How dare you treat this child with disrespect and dishonor because the child's lifestyle is not what you expected it to be and not what you wanted it to be. No, you got to fall on your face. And you got to keep going before God. God, you gave me this child, and I'm doing the best that I can to raise this child. You told me that you would save me and my household. My child is a part of my household. That's my legacy. That's, that's my inheritance, God. You promised me. You said children are a heritage of the Lord. And blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. And you, have, you have to go back to God, and you have to keep saying those things to God, putting God in remembrance of his word. But watch this now. But you can't criticize that individual and put that individual down. Can you be upset with the lifestyle? Of course you can. Can you draw the line in the, in the sand with the lifestyle? Of course you can. But you cannot have the mentality of cursing them out, belittling them, and talking down to them because you are hurt. Of course you are hurt. But that's your child. You got to still love them. Let me close with this. I don't know why we're on this homosexual thing at this moment. See, people, when you talk to them about Solomon and Gomorrah, they're talking about that God killed Sodom and Gomorrah or destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that were surrounding them because of homosexuality. When you go deeper into the New Testament, like, like Zechariah and Ezekiel, I believe it is, the Bible said that God destroyed them for more than homosexuality. He destroyed them also because they would not take care of the widows in their town. So here's how God's looking at them. He sees them completely different in the way you see them. And so what you have heard down through the years, he, he destroyed them because Sodom and Gomorrah, they were homosexual. No, he, he destroyed them also, the Bible said, because they would not take care of the widows in their town. So he takes us a step further. So watch now. I can't treat people like this. My job was saved one time because of a homosexual man. Saved my job. I could have had just look in his face like, I don't want him standing to say nothing for me, but he saved my job. I'm grateful that God would use anybody to save my job. He saved my job. So how dare we criticize and ostracize people, the ones that are in your home that you have been given the responsibility to raise. You may not agree with their lifestyle, 
You may not agree with it. You're 100% for God and you should be. But don't throw your children away because they're living a life that you didn't choose. They're battling their identity. Don't throw them away. Keep praying for them. Keep showing them love. The Bible tells us that love conquers all. Love covers all. It covers all. Love can cause people to change. And the way you know that love can cause people to change, it calls you to change. And look at where you are today. You are not the individual that you used to be years ago. You have completely changed. Today is today that you let your kid out of the spiritual bondage that you have them in today. You can sit down with the child and say to the child, I've done this with all of my children. Sit them down. Hey, uh, look, I'm, I'm just straightforward. Hey, look, ain't no, ain't no pulling no punches. You, 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 you homosexual, you lesbian, you gay. Hey, come clean today right now. Let dad know. No, no, I'm not like that. Okay, all right. Ain't no, ain't, no, ain't no hate now. If that's what your lifestyle is, ain't no hate. Dad gonna love on you anyway, but, but you need to know there's some boundaries here. The boundaries is you, you can't bring your boyfriend over here. You can't bring your girlfriend over here. You, you can't do that. Dad, dad ain't gonna have that one. You understand? You understand that my house is holy. My house is peaceful. You, you're not bringing nothing up in here that's gonna stir the peace. You understand? What, 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 if, what if we got a, what am I, what if, what if you, one of them got a girlfriend? What, what if my son got a girlfriend? Yeah, you bring a girlfriend over here. You understand? But you ain't finna do nothing else up in here. You understand? That's the whole, that line is drawn in the sand. Y'all, y'all ain't coming up in here, hugging on each other, kissing on up each other, and all this type of stuff. The only person doing some kissing and hugging and doing some things like that is me. Me and my wife. Ain't nobody else doing that up here. I draw the line in the sand. I'ma hang out with you. I love you. I care about you. You can't invite me to your party. I'm not going. Can't invite me to the party. You got notice off the bat. You can't invite me to the party. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to your wedding. You understand that ain't going. So you need to know that. You need to know that off the bat. I'ma love you. I'ma celebrate you. I'ma support you. But there's some things I'm not doing. You have to draw the line in the sand, and you have to let your child know, I love you, but I can't cross these lines. And there are people who are watching me today. You have literally kept your kid in a spiritual dungeon. And you kept them handcuffed. And all they want right now from you is love. Love is what's going to break them out. It doesn't mean that you agree with the sin. And you have to stop walking around feeling embarrassed. I don't know who you are, but you feel embarrassed in front of your family members. You feel embarrassed when you are out with them somewhere. Perhaps people are looking at me. Of course they're looking at you. Of course they're looking at you. But you cannot allow their thoughts of you to dictate how you love your child and how you treat your child. You just can't do it. You can't do it. I'm talking to somebody today. You need to sit down with your child, whoever you are, you need to sit down with your child and ask your child to forgive you for the way that you have conducted yourself with them. You gotta sit down and talk to them. You don't know the reason that they went this way. Maybe they didn't feel they could get love from somebody else. Maybe they got introduced to this lifestyle and it's hard for them to break free. When you start to hear your child say to you, I know this is wrong, that means that your child has hope and your child hasn't been turned over to a reprobate mind. I don't know who I'm talking to now. You know that your child hasn't been turned over to a reprobate mind. That's hope for them because your child is saying these things to you that this, I know this is not right, but something keeps drawing them back. Something keeps pulling them to it. You gotta stand up and go to war for your child. You have to intercede for your child. You have to do that. Your child is not in a position to intercede for themselves. So they need, God needs you to stand up and intercede for your child. I'm talking to somebody today. You need to hear this. You need to go to war for your child. You need to go to bat for your child. You need to war for your child. Your child may not, your child may not even change their lifestyle in your lifetime. But you can best believe that your, that your prayers of intercession is not going to go unheard. God's going to turn this situation around. <laughs> because he don't see people the way we do. <laughs> That's my time right there. I pray your life was blessed, man. It's getting gloomy out here. I don't think y'all really can see me that well now. But anyway, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all today. Do me a favor. Get your seed in the ground today. Go to our website at kingdomlifefaithcenter.org. Click on the online giving button there and get your seed in the ground today. I greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate you. To everybody who's been sowing your seed, I declare and decree a thousand times blessing over your life. And I thank you that many doors and I'm praying that many doors and many opportunities will present themselves to you and open themselves to you. I believe God will do great and mighty things for you today. So get your seed in the ground today. 
Don't hesitate on your giving. Whatever it is that God has put in your heart to sow, you need to get it in the ground. Whether it's $5, $50, $2,000, $100, whatever it is, get it in the ground today. If you're being fed by this ministry every day, it's on the right, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, that the person who teaches you, it's on the right for them to ask for a seed from you. I know many times people don't understand it, but listen to this. If the word that I give transformed your life and take you to another level in God, you should want to sow back into the place that has helped you. You should want to do that because your life is being transformed and changed. So get your seed in the ground today. Go to our website, kingdomlifefaithcenter.org. Click on the online giving button there and get your seed in the ground, all right? Hey, also, you can sow uh, directly to my wife and I through the Cash App if you like. The Cash App is the dollar sign, Pastor Perryman. I mean, Pastor C. Perryman. Again, the dollar sign, Pastor C. Perryman. Or if you want to sow directly to my wife, the dollar sign, Pastor Sophia. Get it in the ground today. I greatly appreciate you, all right? Listen, I got to give somebody their day today. Got to give somebody their day today. But let me pray for you first. Don't go anywhere. I got to give somebody their day, all right? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everything that you have done for us. I thank you for your love and your kindness and your tender mercies that has been shown to us. I thank you, Father, for just granting us new mercies every morning. You said, and great is your faithfulness. So I thank you today. I thank you, Father, right now that you are helping us to see from a new perspective. I thank you that you are helping us, God, to see from your perspective. And I thank you that you're opening new doors for your people. Help us, God, to look at people with love and not disdain. Help us, God, to see people the way you see them. Help us to have compassion on people. But, God, help us not to be ran over by people. I pray today, God, for the country of Belize. I pray for my town, Itabina, Mississippi. I pray for the Delta as a whole. And I ask in Jesus' name, God, that you will pour your, your favor, your healing, your deliverance, your peace, your prosperity out over these three places. And, God, I thank you that even as I'm praying now, miracles are taking place in every Belizean home today. Miracles are taking place in every American home today. Miracles are taking place in every home in the Delta now. Every home in Itabina is blessed now. And God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, I got to give somebody their day today. Today is Miss Marucky Yates' day. It's Miss Mar Marucky Yates' day. Whatever Miss Marucky Yates wants, she gets whatever she needs. Get supplied. It's her day today. So y'all show her some love. Show her some appreciation today. Please do that for me. Hey, uh, also today is Miss Bambi's day. Whatever Miss Bambi wants, she gets whatever Miss Bambi needs. Get supplied. It's her day today. And also... It's Lyndon Yates' day. Whatever Lyndon wants, he gets. Whatever Lyndon needs, get supplied. It's his day today. And uh, so, hey, y'all show them some love. It's an all Belizean day today. Show them some love and some appreciation today. I really appreciate you. So that's a hint, Miss Karen Yates. Whatever Lyndon wants, he gets. Whatever Lyndon wants, he gets. <laughs> show him some love today. <laughs> man, shout out to Miss Sharonda Powell, who's on today. And uh, shout out to Miss... Miss Sheila Roby, I don't see her on here, so that means she's late. She's late. We got. We, we may have to call her into the office. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Irene Holmes today as well. But listen, get your seat in the ground today. I'm getting ready to let y'all go. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all so very much. Hell, shout out to my cousin Byron Williams, man. I forgot to make mention of him this morning. Shout out to him. Thank you so much for being on today, man. I appreciate you. All right? Hey, love y'all. I'll see y'all again tomorrow morning. Y'all be blessed in Jesus' name. Love y'all.